Hey, what's up guys? My name is The Cherno, and welcome back to my C++ series. I need a haircut. So today we're going to be talking all about object lifetimes, and we're going to kind of start talking about memory and how objects live specifically on the stack. I am going to make a heat versus stack video in which we can actually talk about this stuff in depth, as well as probably benchmark the difference in terms of performance, and just talk about all the performance kind of metrics. and. And and, uh, and and all that kind of stuff in that video. But today we're just gonna, this is like a gentle introduction to what lifetime kind of means for stack-based variables. So there's kind of two parts to this. There's, there's the, the first part is kind of you have to understand how things live on the stack in order for you to actually be able to write code that doesn't crash and code that works. But also the, sec the, sec the next step, once you know how this works, is the I now know how to leverage this and make it kind of do what I want it to do and come up with clever ways to do things. And we'll, we'll talk, we'll, we'll look at some examples of what I mean by that today. But basically we have this concept of stacks. How do stacks work? We'll have a, we'll have a video in depth about that. I know that I keep saying we'll have a video for pretty much every topic, but it's just, I don't want to focus on the details of certain elements in every video because otherwise these videos will be 45 minutes and not helpful to people who already know that stuff. That's why I'm kind of trying to modularize this series. But basically a stack can be thought of as a data structure in which you stack things on top. Pretend that you've got a stack of books on your desk. In order for you to actually access one in the middle, you would have to take the first few off to, to get to that, that book in the middle. Of course, in real life, you could just yank it out, but that's not how stacks work in programming. So every time we enter a scope in C++, we basically push a, push a stack frame on. It doesn't necessarily have to be a stack frame in the case of I'm actually pushing data on, but you can think of it as adding a book to your pile. And any variables that you declare inside that scope is like writing stuff into your book. And once that scope ends and you take that book off of your pile of books, it's gone, right? Every stack-based variable which you declared in that book, every object that you created on the stack inside that book, they're gone now. And that is both a blessing and a curse, but if you know what you're doing, then obviously it's just going to be a blessing 100% of the time, right? So I'm going to show you some examples of exactly how all of this comes together and how all of this works, and hopefully that'll make it painfully obvious to you. So first of all, let's talk about scopes. A scope can be anything from a function scope, like what this is right here, some kind of if statement scope, like this, or could also be in a for loop or a while loop, or just an empty scope, like that. We also have scopes for classes, meaning that when I declare a class like entity, that's my go-to example, and I have some kind of stack initialized variable here, so something that isn't allocated on the heap here, then this variable is also inside this class scope, meaning that when this class dies, this variable dies. So let's see this in action. I'm going to just write a very simple entity class here. This doesn't have to be an entity class, could be absolutely anything. It's going to have a constructor here, which is going to print something to the console, like created entity. And we're also going to give this class a destructor. I'm actually just gonna copy this, add the tilde here to make it a destructor and change this to destroyed entity. So we have created entity in the constructor and destroyed entity in the destructor. Inside this scope over here, I'm going to declare my entity. Instead of creating it on the heap, I'm going to create it on the stack just by writing code like so. This is going to call the, the default constructor. I'm going to put a breakpoint on this line and hit F5 to run my program. Okay, so once I hit this breakpoint, I'm just going to open my console here so that we can see what's happening. If I hit F10 to advance one line forward, you'll see the created entity gets printed to the console. Now we are at the end of this scope here. So as soon as I hit F10, we are destroying our entity. That entity is gone now, that memory has been freed. Should be pretty obvious. If I was to do a heap allocation on this, by converting this into a pointer and writing code like so, with optional parentheses, if I hit F5 here, I'll step one line of code forward and you can see that we didn't even go to the scope here. If I look at my console, we just say credit entity and that's it. We're already on this line. I can even execute this line. So right now we're actually waiting for input and you can see our entity never gets destroyed. Of course, that memory does get cleaned up by the operating system when our application terminates. So straight away, you should see the difference in object lifetimes between a stack-based variable and a heap-based variable. The stack-based variable gets freed, gets destroyed as soon as we go out of scope. So that's basically the point of today's video. I just want you to get it into your head that if you declare something on the stack, if you create a variable on the stack, it's going to cease to exist when it goes out of scope. Now, let's take a look at some things you might not want to do now that you have this knowledge. A great example is I want to create an array inside a function. Maybe it's an integer array, so it will return an int pointer. I'll call this create array. 
and I might write code such as int array. So this is going to allocate the array 50 integers large, and then I can return array. Now this looks like perfectly sensible code. I mean, it's creating an array and then returning a pointer to that array it seems legit, right? Wrong. You're completely wrong if you thought that was legit. I really hope you didn't. Let's take a look at why. So by creating an array like this, we're not allocating it on the heap. We're not calling new or doing some kind of heap allocation. We are just declaring it on the stack. And when we return a pointer to that, it's returning a pointer to that stack memory. Guess what? That stack memory gets cleared as soon as we go out of scope. So if you write code like this, it's going to fail. If you would like to write a function like this, you basically have two options. You can either get this to actually allocate the array on the heap, thus ensuring that its lifetime will actually stay around. Or you could ask this data that you've created here to actually be copied to a location that exists further up the stack. So as an example, let's say I actually create my array over here of 50 integers, and then I want this create array to be more of a fill array, which would take in that array as a parameter and actually do anything that it had to do here. Of course, this example of creating an array kind of falls apart since we're no longer creating it inside here, but we are still basically manipulating it. So maybe this could do something like fill our array. And in this sense, we're just passing a pointer so it's not going to get deallocated. That array creation is a classic mistake which I actually tend to see all the time. People will create a stack based variable and then try to return a pointer to it not realizing that once that function ends and you go out of scope that variable's done. So with this kind of automatic destruction of stack based variables is there a way that we can kind of make it useful? Is there a way that we can leverage it and use it for good? And the answer is yes. There are plenty of ways in which this is incredibly useful and can actually help kind of automate our code. And one thing that we can do with this is actually write scoped kind of classes, right? Such as a smart pointer, like unique pointer, which is a scoped pointer, or something like a scoped lock. There, there's a lot of examples, which we will definitely get into in the future. But the simplest example is probably a scoped pointer. What that basically is, is a class that's a wrapper over a pointer, which upon construction, heap allocates the pointer, and then upon destruction, delete the pointer so we can kind of automate this new and delete thing let's take a look at how we might write a class like that so this entity right i want to still allocate it on the heap i want to call new and all that however i want it to automatically be deleted when this goes out of scope can we do that the answer is yes we could use something in the standard library called a unique pointer which is a scoped pointer but for the purposes of this example we'll write our own so that you can see how it works i write a class called scoped pointer i'm going to keep it really simple for now and just hard code it to only accept entities so this will be our actual pointer upon construct I'm going to write a constructor which takes in our entity. So this is an entity pointer. I'm going to assign it to here. And upon destruction, I'm going to call delete and pointer, just like that. And that's it. That is a basic scoped pointer. So let's take a look at how we can use that. Instead of writing entity E equals new entity, I'm actually going to write scoped pointer E, which is basically our variable name, equals new entity. I could have also written this like so with the default constructor, but just to keep it similar to what it was before, it kind of looks the same. And of course this works due to implicit conversion. So this kind of looks like identical code, but the difference is that this will actually get destroyed once we go out of scope, because of course the scoped pointer class itself, the scoped pointer object gets allocated on the stack which means that it gets deleted. And when it gets deleted automatically, it calls delete in the destructor, which deletes that, that pointer that it's wrapping. So if we put a breakpoint here and hit F5, we'll advance one line forward, check our console. We, we can see that we're creating the entity. And then one line forward again, and check this out. We destroyed our entity, even though we use new to heap allocate it. And that is a great example of, first of all, what a very basic smart pointer called unique pointer does. We're going to have an entire video dedicated to smart pointers very soon. I know people have been like, people have been complaining about me using new and not using smart pointers and teaching bad C++. We're going to have a real, real chat about that later, by the way. But for all of you waiting for smart pointers, we're definitely going to do a video on that very, very soon because they're a very important part of the language. So this kind of automatic creation, automatic destruction that we can kind of get from the fact that a stack based variable goes out of scope and gets destroyed is actually really useful. And there are plenty, there are plenty of more examples just to name another one off the top of my head, a timer. Let's just say you want to time how long you are inside a scope for benchmarking or something. You could write a timer class which starts the timer upon construction of the object and then stops the timer and maybe prints the result or whatever when the object when the timer object gets destroyed. So suddenly you've got an automatic timer. You can just write one line of code at the beginning of your function and that entire scope is going to now be timed and you don't you never have to call timer.stop or whatever manually because as soon as it goes out of scope, it calls that for you automatically. It's, 
really amazing and there's so many uses for it. Another one is mutex locking. If you want to lock a function so that multiple threads can't access it at the same time and cause an explosion, you can have an automatic scoped lock, which at the beginning of the function locks it and at the end of the function unlocks it. And threads are coming soon. I really can't wait to get into the more kind of complicated and fun stuff in C++, so don't you worry. Many more videos are coming. Hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, you can hit that like button. I think it's in that corner. I was always pointing over there and all the other videos, but I think it's here. So now that you know where it is, you can click it. You can also help support this series on Patreon by going to patreon.com forward slash the churno. There's plenty of cool rewards that you can get access to, such as a private Discord chat where we plan these videos. You can request whatever you like. You can ask me any questions you want there as well. And I, of course, I've I, of course, answer all of my patrons because why wouldn't I? But the most important thing you do by supporting is just making sure that I can make more of these videos and get them out as fast as possible. So huge thank you to all of my supporters on that. I will see you guys next time. I think next time we're going to finally talk about smart pointers because, oof, yeah. I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye.